Hello. This slide in beginning our lecture uh, shows the Opera House in Paris, France, opened in 1875. It escaped destruction in World War I and in World War II. And believe it or not, I lived in a hotel just a few blocks from this beautiful building uh, from about 1954 to 1956 when I was just two. Okay, let's go to the next slide. There we go. Let me tell you the secret that has led me to my goal. My strength lies solely in my tenacity. Louis Pasteur said that. Of course, any science takes a lot of work, and certainly he did that. Okay, as we conclude <clears throat> the chapter on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, we're going to look at applications of these two important areas to forensic toxicology and mainly use um, case histories to discuss some of these principles that you see listed on this slide. So as we apply the principles of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics to forensic toxicology, we need to find the answers to four basic questions. These usually come up during uh, investigations. One, are drugs involved? This is going to involve using analytical toxicology. Number two, how much did the subject take? This is going to involve pharmacokinetics. Three, when was it taken? This involves pharmacokinetics as well. And four, was it a cause of death or did it affect the behavior of the subject? The answer involves pharmacodynamics to answer that question. So analytical toxicology is the science of chemical or physical tests for drugs and poisons. Our knowledge of distribution and pharmacokinetics of the drug will determine the test methods that we're going to use. Uh, target analytes will be determined by the knowledge of distribution of pharmacokinetics as well as sensitivity, specificity, and even the specimen type to be tested. This figure shows the distribution of cocaine and cocaine metabolites in blood, saliva, urine, sweat, and hair. A test in the urine should target, as you can see here, benzoylectinine and ectinine methyl ester. If you look at this chart carefully, BE is benzoylectinine and EME is ectinine methyl ester. CE is coke. Ethylene, which is an active metabolite of cocaine. So in the regards to urine, you can see that those would be the targets, these two right here. A specimen chosen for toxicological testing depends on the question being asked and the time course of drug or metabolites in the specimen. This figure shows the window of detection for cocaine and metabolites in blood, saliva, urine, sweat, and hair. To find out if a person was ever exposed, and if so, how often, the best specimens to test are bones, nails, and hair. To see if a person used cocaine in the past three to seven days, urine or sweat testing is indicated. To determine if a person is under the influence of cocaine, the test must be done on the blood or saliva or in brain tissue in the case of a death investigation. <clears throat> how much drug was taken? First calculate how much drug is in the body at the time of death or at the time of obtaining the sample from the living person. This is calculated from the person's weight in kilograms and the volume of distribution of the drug, V sub D. Now we calculate the amount of drug eliminated from the body. History and observations will indicate the route of administration and give clues as to the drug's bioavailability. Are there capsules in the GI tract upon autopsy? Is there liquids and food material in the stomach at autopsy? Can alcohol be detected in the contents of the stomach? Are barbiturates in the stomach and in the intestine? 
Drugs of abuse are often injected or inhaled. You may wonder why. Of course, you may remember we talked about the first pass effect or the first pass metabolism effect of the liver causing inactivation. So if those can be avoided, which they can be by injection directly into the blood or from inhalation, that is what those who are abusing drugs will do. At autopsy, presence of puncture marks, drug in the nostrils, burns on the lips and fingers, as from smoking cocaine, will give clues about the drugs abused. Okay, let's look at a series of case histories. <clears throat> case history one, nude female body in the river. A body of a 20 to 30 year old woman, 55 kilogram in weight, found nude in the river. No signs of trauma and autopsy showed she did not drown. Drawn, the lungs were congested. Blood-free blood -free morphine was 0.45 milligrams per liter. Blood total morphine was 0.7 milligrams per liter. Blood codeine was 0.03 milligrams per liter. Hair continuously positive along the entire length for morphine as well as 6-monoacetylmorphine, a metabolite of heroin, was in the hair. What is the amount of morphine and heroin in the body? Now, we're going to answer this question, but later on we're coming back to this case history number one. You can see a classic calculation is shown here. The amount in the body in milligrams will equal the volume of distribution VD that's determined in the lab for drugs, like a constant number characteristic of a drug, and it is um, in liters per kilogram, as noted here, 3.3 plus or minus 0.9 liters per kilogram for morphine. Gives you a range. Um, so we can calculate the amount equals the VD, 3.3 liters per kilogram, times the weight of the subject in the case history was 55 kilograms and then the concentration in the blood was 0.45 milligrams per liter. Multiply these numbers out we get 81 milligrams per morphine and of course this is at the <clears throat> lower end of the range of the volume of distribution which can account for morphine and heroin the upper range, 3.3 plus 0.9, if you were to multiply that by 55 and then by 0.45, you get 103, which is the upper range of, of the volume, using the upper range of the volume of distribution. So you can see the amount of these possible amounts of these drugs of abuse in the body of this subject. Case history two, asleep at the wheel, diazepam, common name, Valley. Car is driven by a 31-year-old white male. Crossed over the center line and hit a car head-on, resulting in multiple fatalities. The driver's blood specimen at the hospital two hours after the crash contained 1.4 milligrams per liter diazepam, 2.5 milligrams per liter of nordiazepam, which is another drug known as Nordaz and 0.04 grams per deciliter ethanol. What was the amount of diazepam in the body? Okay, using the similar equation that we saw earlier, diazepam amount in the body is 1.1 plus or minus 0.3 liters per kilogram. This is the volume of distribution of this particular drug times 72 kilograms, which is the weight of the subject mentioned in the case history. 1.4 milligrams per liter is what was measured in the blood. So doing the calculation, there was 110 milligrams possible in the body. Now if we use the range based on the, the plus or minus 0.3 of the volume of distribution, this is what the range of the possible amounts of diazepam would be. Nor diazepam, if we know, it doesn't note here the volume of distribution, but knowing that and then the weight of the subject times the amount found in the blood will equal 79 milligrams. Okay, looking further, <clears throat> let's look at case history three. 
27-year-old white male, six feet tall and weighing 176 pounds, was stopped by police because of swerving in traffic. He failed the field sobriety tests. His blood alcohol concentration determined 1.5 hours after the stop was 0.25 grams per deciliter. So obviously they had to take him to the clinic or to the hospital, to their lab, to have blood drawn. He remembers drinking five to six beers in the afternoon, ending his drinking about four hours before the incident. Is his drinking history accurate? Okay, so he gave the history of drinking five to six beers in the afternoon, about four hours before the incident. So let's look at how we might do some calculations and look at this. Okay. There's one, two, three different calculations shown on this slide. Up here, we're shown the amount of alcohol in the man's body at the time the blood specimen was obtained. Here, concentration, this calculation, is the expected blood alcohol concentration from drinking five to six beers four hours before the incident. And it is being calculated using the same equation uh, that we used earlier except rearranging it to calculate concentration in the blood. And then down here, C, this is the average rate of elimination of alcohol, which actually is 0 0.015 grams per deciliter per hour. In four hours, it would have, it would ha it would have further declined by 0.06 grams per deciliter and we can take these numbers and look at what we would predict to be in existence versus what was actually measured uh, when the blood alcohol level was determined. Does that match up with what you would expect based on the history? And we can see um, here um, the amount of alcohol in the man's body um, at the time of the blood specimen being taken is shown. And if we went through the calculation here, we have 0 0.130. Um, and by history given, it would be 0 0.130. By the measurement in the blood, the measurement in the blood was 0.25 grams per deciliter. So and even based on the history, if we had um, the loss of blood based on this calculation down here, the amount given by the history would not be comparable to what was measured in the blood. So um, we have 0 0.14 minus 0 0.06. So we have a difference of 0 0.08 grams per deciliter. Therefore, the drinking history is not accurate. Okay, I think we will stop right here for part one.